as human beings are terrible at discerning opportunity from distraction. Yeah. We'll store money in these insurance plans where it's protected from liability, where it's protected from bankruptcy, where it's protected from taxation because they had a family office and because they utilize the power of life insurance and its tax advantages. But your upside is only limited by your willingness to add value to people's lives, which means you have to gain a skill set of communication. I love the death benefit because I think I can use the death benefit while I'm alive. Yes. Never short stopping, now I'm winning like I'm Jida. Steady through the rigor. So my guest today comes back for his second interview on the Seven Figure Squad YouTube channel. Uh, we met uh, a few months ago when he opened up his comedy show here in uh, in Fort Worth, Texas, and he just came back from Daytona Beach, Florida, to perform on our stage in front of two thousand plus agents. It's called the To the Moon event, and uh, we had a conversation backstage about life insurance, and that was his free his, that was his previous life before getting into this next chapter of life, which is edutaining people about money through the gift of comedy. But back with us is Garrett Gunderson, the author of What Would the Rockefellers Do? What Would the Rockefellers Do? So Garrett, welcome back to Seven Figure Squad. Good to be with you again, man. I really enjoyed our last interview and definitely the PHP to the moon event was to the moon, bro. You, you put on one hell of a show. It was awesome. I mean, you, you've been around the insurance game for a while. I mean, uh, well, from your observational standpoint, what, what, what kind of, from an objective third-party standpoint, what, what, what kind of differentiated us between any other FMO you, you observe out there? All right, so I got to, I got to tell the story to give, give the contrast. So, okay. like, I go to this event back in like 2005 or something in, in Hawaii. It's for the leaders of this insurance company, and you know, I was getting into speaking at the time and getting trained, and they go. So do you have any feedback for us? I was like, oh yeah, yeah, I definitely do if you want it. They're like, what's the feedback? I'm like, uh, have your people stop reading monotone off the teleprompter. <laughs> it is so painful. Bring in some quality speakers that can engage and entertain the audience. And like, I kind of was seeing it. I don't know, they asked for my feedback and I gave it. So yeah. now I go to PHP and it's like, dude, ET, Eric Thomas comes out. People stood through the whole talk. They're, they're yelling out, they're clapping, they're having a good time. Deion Sanders shows up, you know, like you, you just bring amazing people and everybody's there excited to be there. There's this huge energy versus like being totally bored versus <laughs> just. And so I was like, this is killer, man. Like I was I was really, really impressed with uh, the type of show that you put on. And, and then your speech was just so dialed in with the same way that I think you were talking about everything from perspective and mindset and as a man thinketh and how we take actions in accordance with our vision and i was like yes 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 and you know and, and dude, yeah. you just walk around people are high-fiving you they're giving you knocks they're hugging you it was just like a really cool like familial kind of thing that was going on with top-notch high quality people showing up and dude everybody in attendance that came up and took a picture with me or talked to me like hey thanks for being here like what made you show up like, why are you here? Like, what can, you know, like, it's so exciting. I've been watching your videos. Like, they just showed up with so much love and energy. And I was, and you, your team was like, hey, do you want to just go be by yourself over here? I'm like, nah, I like talking to everybody. It's cool. Let's just keep talking. And so, like, dude, that was just the whole experience is high energy. And it was pretty cool to see a bunch of Latinos and African Americans and, you know, just like out there like just doing their thing and, and reaching yeah. people that no one else is reaching. So it looked like no other uh, insurance event that I've ever been to. <laughs> I think what, what uh, freaks out a lot of people is that they, they enter the insurance industry because, because 90% plus of the licensed agents that we have on board, never experienced the insurance industry ever before in their entire life before PHP. And then they think that the insurance industry is just like this. And when they're like, yo, it's, it's, it's kind of different out there outside of our umbrella. Uh, with, with PHP, so I, I appreciate you uh, uh, performing on our stage and, and sharing your gift and educating us about money. I think everybody loves your rap jam at the end when you wrap things up. It's kind of like, yo, Garrett, uh, raps. <laughs> you know, I'm 43 year old white man, and uh, you know, I was like, why not? But it's it's this whole kind of like, what are all the names we have for money? And I definitely noticed people pulled out their phones, paid a little bit closer attention to that bar. And it's a, it's a pretty fun thing to do is uh, just kind of raffle off, you know, right, just all these different phrases and ideas that people are captivated around money. That's it. And uh, 
we had a conversation backstage because, you know, a lot of people followed your content previous to becoming a stand-up comedian. A lot of people followed your content because they're, they're voracious readers of your content that you put out there. Your New York Times bestselling author, uh, Killing the Sacred Cow, and What Would the Rockefellers Do? And, and I'm, I'm massively intrigued because you talked about here in your book and, and um, having a Rockefeller plan for your, your children. And, and I, love, I love the fact that you want to have your children reap Atlas Shrugged and you give them $10,000 what, what a great way to uh, incent incentivize your kids by reading that freaking fat have, manual of a book. <laughs> I have one of the first 10,000 copies signed by Ayn Rand no. and Nathaniel Brandon, who it was dedicated to, sitting on the back shelf right here. So, Sick. yeah. Sick. That, now, that's, not a, that's not a cheap... That's like a, that's memorabilia right there. That's a you collectible. Know, an attorney gave it to me that we've referred a boatload of business to, so I'm not sure what check he wrote, but then Nathaniel Brandon was someone I got introduced to. So I said, hey, will you sign my book? So it's cool that I signed it and Nathaniel, since they're both dead. And, uh, you know, man, that that is the longest book that I've ever read, I think, you know, it was, it was one behemoth of a book and I read it in my 20s, you know, oh, and uh, and there's just 50 pages that are so dense that I actually got the audio book and re-listened to that part, the Galt speech over and over again. And so, yeah, it's like, hey, Kids, if you if you'll learn some things that are different ways of thinking than what you would ever learn from the mainstream media, that I think are critical ways to question everything that's going on yeah. and understand what it means to be a value producer and what it means to like you know create something and have a vision and the obstacles that come with that. I think that book really does a, a nice job and written by someone that was in communist Russia before, yeah. right? So I had a really deep, intense relationship with the implications of communism. And this is this. It took her ten years to write the book, and it got released in 1957. And how eerie is it that it's reflective of what's going Ooh. on in America today? It's Everybody pretty poignant. Crazy. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So, so a couple, uh, a couple of directions we're going to take this. Uh, first direction we're going to take is just talk about the Rockefeller uh, conversation. And, yeah. and oftentimes people say, "I want to create generational wealth. I want to create generational wealth." For, by the way, first question I want to ask you, because this has been a, a topic of intense debate amongst our offices, because we tend to recruit a lot of people from a real estate background, a tax background, a legal background, you know, uh, a T-shirt background, they got a clothing company. And a lot of people think that, man, I need to make multiple streams of income. And my pushback sometimes with them, which is not agreeable to a lot of them, I said, just focus on one thing real quick. Focus on one thing for the mm -hmm. first you know, make your first cash flow million first. And then th that's been yes. my debate on it. And I don't know if you agree with that or not, but- I love that philosophy. And I do agree with it, Matt, because I feel like multiple streams of distraction can happen where we get spread thin. And what if one of the streams dries up? Now we go divert our attention to that and we're not caring for the other streams. And I kind of think about the Amazon river. It's this fresh river with so much life around it and so much life in it that I'd be scared to go in it, right? Yeah. And it flows so powerfully into the ocean that you can find fresh water for miles into the ocean where the, where the Amazon comes in. So create that powerful flow. And when that powerful flow is maybe 80% something that happens without your daily attention and time, then it might make sense to create another stream. But the problem is if we have a bunch of streams, they're just not powerful enough. There's, and, and we get derailed and distracted and I call it being diversified because how could, you know, and then it starts infringing upon our health and our family and time to ourselves because we as human beings are terrible at discerning opportunity from distraction. And there are things that can make you money that are a distraction because they prevent you from making the most money. Literally a conversation I'm having with my business partner today is you know some of our team members one of them wants to make more money and they're like well i was thinking about going and doing some freelance work and i'm like well what if we could create opportunities within the organization and make sure that your time is most well spent versus getting into another thing that takes a lot of momentum because as you know starting something from scratch requires herculean effort versus when there's already a platform and already an infrastructure that you could plug into and build from you can have accelerated results. So I started in 1998 selling life insurance. And the first, you know, the first type of insurance that I sold, uh, well, actually in 1997, I bought a variable universal life, a yeah, variable yeah, universal yeah, life, yeah, yeah, yeah. which yeah. I'm, not a, I'm not a big fan of variable universal life based upon certain things. We could discuss that, but it got me in the game. And I started to ask questions. And then what I found was 
selling insurance for a few years from 1998 to 2005, I made a good living. It created recurring revenue. And I really focused my attention there. I didn't do assets under management. I didn't you know, build a lot of other things. It wasn't until 2005, we started to do workshops and I started to write, you know, uh, create a membership and do books and things like that, which eventually drew my interest and was where my heart was at, which I think has improved the industry. Like I, I've met yes. a lot of people that I didn't know who they were. They're like, oh, thanks for your book. And I, I like that, right? Like that called to me, but there's not a lot of people that are weird and crazy enough to sit down and write a book. I have a book deadline this week, as a matter of fact, and it could be a bit strenuous. And, and it's like, we kind of forget about the pain as authors of writing a book and they're like, oh yeah, that wasn't so bad. And they're like, oh wait, the editing process and all that kind of stuff. So I think it's, you know, there's a lot of like people getting distracted because it looks good from the outside. Oh, I want to do that because someone else has done that. Or, ooh, I've got this opportunity over here and that opportunity. Ooh, maybe I could go uh, flip NFTs and then I can go, you know, buy the next crypto thing. And then I could do an, an insurance thing. Nice. And then I could get into real estate. And what happens is you never develop your expertise fully. You end up being able to give half effort or less to a bunch of different things that other people, if they put full effort to, will surpass you. And so I'm with you. Multiple sources of distraction, more than multiple sources of income, is what happens. And focus on that cash flow first. And, and the Rockefellers, I mean, they focused in on their, you know, their gold rush of their day, which is which is oil. And so, yep. you know, let, let's let's take it from when John D. Rockefeller starts to say, okay. Uh, uh, by the way, Gary, you you've studied them pretty deeply. I, I'm curious. Do you know the size of the life insurance policy initially purchased? to create and fund the, the family bank of the Rockefeller? I, I, do you know that number? I don't know it anymore. Yeah, I think it was like around, I think maybe it was like 2 million. I've, I've heard rumors. I'm not sure. Yeah. I've heard 2 million, which at that time in the-, in the, the Was a lot of money. It was a lot of money. Right. And so, and so the interesting thing about the Rockefellers is they bought life insurance policies and all the, and all the kids. So what's yeah. something about the Rockefellers that a lot, what's some of the factors about the Rockefellers, Garrett, that a lot of people don't know about today as a, as a result about their money? Well, look, one thing is that they were not nearly as wealthy as the Vanderbilts were at one time. The Vanderbilts actually had more money than the U.S. Treasury. And so they were global and, and with what was going on in shipping. And when Cornelius died, his oldest son doubled that estate in nine years, but then he died. And they had no infrastructure or plan of what to do next. So it ended up getting decimated heavily over the next 54 years, because 54 years later, the first Vanderbilt died broke. Now, you know, Gloria Vanderbilt had still inherited some money and Anderson Cooper, her son, her son. could, you know, there's some stories out there about them. But the last time uh, it was documented, the Vanderbilts got together for a family reunion. There wasn't a single millionaire there. So they gave a million dollars to create Vanderbilt University and they still have their name associated with that. But they used to own the Breakers in Rhode Island. They don't own it anymore. They own 10 mansions in New York. They don't own those anymore. They own the Biltmore Estates and the Carolinas. That's gone. What they did was they became massively good at consumption and they didn't have any type of structure to perpetuate the wealth, which really the, the Rockefellers did two things amazingly. Well, three. Um, first off is they made oil affordable to everybody and that really gave them a rise, right? But then what they did was the Rockefellers bought insurance policies as you were talking about on their kids. Said, hey, if a Rockefeller's born, we're gonna use this. The death benefit comes in tax-free upon their death and helps to replenish the trust because we think the trust will grow, but because of taxes, because of economics, because of you know interest rates or whatever, we wanna create these additional safeguards. And they did that, but they also, created a family office. And obviously they're worth so much money that they just had their own team working just for them. They had accountants, attorneys, investment advisors, cash flow specialists, risk management people working just for the Rockefellers. And that kind of where this concept of the family office was born. A, a family had their own financial office working just for them. In today's world, we've seen that become more accessible to the common person because like what I built at my firm Wealth Factory is we went and said, Let's find attorneys and many of them and accountants and many of them and make sure they communicate with one another. But then as we help our clients, they can meet with all these different people. And those people still have hundreds of clients versus just one client like the Rockefeller's family office. But see, what happens is now when something happens to an heir or when something happens to a Rockefeller, the financial team is still in place to support. And there was still instructions and ideas. And the kids came to meetings over time. 
And so this kind of changed things that a they, you know, Wall Street's been really good at making people feel like insurance is boring, like it's not sexy. Like, why would you want to do that when we've got these really cool things over here? And they, they've created a really amazing narrative. But as you look into the uber wealthy, if you look at yep. K1s of the Fortune 500s and look where they're putting money, if you look at corporate owned life insurance, bank owned life insurance, or you look at things like private placement life insurance or premium financing, those are just, for, you know, Coley, Bully, premium financing and private placement life insurance. The ultra wealthy all have those resources. The banks have those, corporations have those, and super wealthy individuals. But why is it that the average person or the middle class person has this narrative that says, no, I should just put my money in diversified portfolio and let that ride. And, and then in a retirement plan, I'll be okay 30 years from today. Well, the news is out. 95% of them are not economically or financially independent when they're 65, but they're putting money in there. It's just, a, they're maybe not putting enough. B, the returns are not what they're purported to be because of a lot of fees and volatility and you know uh, taxes that they didn't take into consideration. And so the, the Rockefellers were saying, hey, we know how to make money in our businesses. We'll make money there. Yeah. We'll store money in these insurance plans where it's protected from liability, where it's protected from bankruptcy, where it's protected from taxation, where upon our death, we can replenish our entire trust and they've got over 150 people getting interest off of this trust today. They're on their sixth generation where the yeah. Vanderbilts have no trust. They're not passing money on because they had a family office and because they utilize the power of life insurance and its tax advantages. So, so that's, a, that's a big departure between those two families. And, and uh, Garrett Gunnison obviously comes from money, his father being a coal miner. <laughs> and my I mean, great grandfather being a coal miner and my grandfather being a coal miner and so you're the first one to literally put a financial stake in the ground and say the gunderson family is going to be different we're going to be entrepreneurs we're not going to be coming in all you know you know you know suited not not suited and booted but but soot uh on your face and uh putting yourself in that risky uh type of scenario i mean how awesome is that that, that you're doing so I, I just met your son uh, right before we hit record button on this thing. He's what, 6'5", right. this big kid, man. 6'5", 16 years old, big dude. <laughs> and so, and so I, I'm curious, you know, in addition to having the opportunity to read Atlas Shrugged, and by the way, if you haven't read the book, Atlas Shrugged, at least go to Amazon and purchase the five DVD part series <laughs> of the movie, <laughs> Atlas Shrugged. By the way, so I'm getting some ink. I'm getting some ink on my back and uh, I'm covering up an old tattoo of mine, but I'm going to have the Atlas Shrugged uh, 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 logo back nice. there. Nice. Yeah, Pretty the guy cool. that wrote "What Would the Rockefellers Do with Me" has the Atlas shrugged on his shoulder. Wow, it looks nope. looks amazing. And uh, yeah, I just got my first ink uh, in, in the last year. So yeah, love it. What, what, what do you got? What did what, what you put on? Uh, I've got, oh, I've, got nice. the, I've got the heart of Christ right here, and a finger touching my forehead in a meditation. And this uh, this blue light standing for consciousness expanded. And what it stands for is. We can face any pain with love, with compassion and love, and on the other side is connection and consciousness. So, uh, yeah, it's 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 got trees from my cabin, and it's seventy some colors in that thing. So, yeah, that's crazy. First how, one. How, how to feel? How to feel it uh, on the shoulder cap there? The, the, the you know, it wasn't it wasn't as bad as I thought it was going to be until I'd been in the chair for like the 14th hour in you know <laughs> 4 30 in the morning and then everything hurt and everything was jarring you know and i was like hey no. can i go to sleep and we'll come back tomorrow for some more this guy was a machine so yeah yeah it's awesome um how many how many rockefellers today garrett are supported and funded and financed by the rockefeller trust you had a number when i that. wrote when i wrote the book it was over 150 Jeez. and we've been trying to get more information we think it's closer to 200 people now um, but, you know, David Rockefeller, who recently died, I saw some amazing interviews with him where he, as a young man, didn't really know how wealthy his family was. He found out from kids at school how wealthy his family was and how well known they were, because the family was really trying to cultivate their kids to learn how to be productive. And they would have these family retreats as he grew older, where he started to understand the amount of responsibility and money they had because the retreats were around, you know, how they could be proper stewards. And what the family values were and, mm -hmm. you know, how they were going to operate overall. And so these retreats became an integral part of their family. Um, and it's important because, you know, the book, The Millionaire Next Door, 
yep. really is the opposite where there's these families that have some money, but they yep. never tell anyone about it. They, they, they pretend like they're paupers or they don't have much cash. And then when they die with little planning, because they're not willing to pay for estate planning, that money falls into their heirs laps and they go, what? And they blow through that money very quickly because they're not mentally prepared wow. at all. And so that's one of the things you don't really hear about that book. And, and look, man, that was my, my book I read when I was like really very, very first year in college. Read that book. I'm like, dude. And it just reinforced me being a miser that pinched pennies and didn't want to spend any money. And then the next year I read Rich Dad Poor Dad, which was a complete departure from that. And I was like, wait, assets creating cash flow. Wait, like it's not about what you reduce, it's what you produce. It was like that was a yeah. game changer. So yeah. so I think that, you know, it's interesting studying the Rockefellers. I haven't done it in years, but when I was writing the book, I just said, What is it that the Rockefellers do? This is the question I went in with. What is it that they do that anyone can do? Not what is it they could do that only wealthy people can do, because obviously having your own family office, you have to be pretty wealthy. Yeah. You know, um, inheriting a bunch of money that you're if you're starting first generation. That, yeah, they're in a different place now, but there were steps that they took. And I said, how can I design that to be most safe and effective for the majority of people that I'm teaching? Which yeah. means, you know, there's some different ideas around insurance that we can discuss today that yeah. a lot of people, you know. Yeah, for sure. I go, yeah. well, what about this? And what about that? <laughs> By the way, what is your biggest, if you're watching this right now, what's been your biggest takeaway thus far? Put it in the comment section below. And also, make sure you find Garrett Gunnerson's Instagram page. Make sure you follow him on IG. We'll put the link below here, too, as well. Because we got to check out your tattoo, man. Uh, yeah, Garrett.live that... Garrett is where, like, Garrett.live will send him to, like, my YouTube channel and stuff like that, too. Love it. Yeah. Sure. Um, but one thing I want, uh, like, we're going on vacation next week, right? So, like, I want to inspire this to uh, our guys at PHP Agency. We're going to Tulum next week, Cancun next week. And a lot of them haven't thought about this. Isn't it funny that we're in the life insurance business and yet some of our life insurance agents have not thought about this concept yet. Uh, but if I was going, if I was going to inspire a quote unquote family retreat and we're in Tulum in the next uh, three, four days next week, what can I simply introduce? What can I encourage our guys to simply introduce this to the family on a quote unquote vacation? So I think focus on three basic things and emphasize at least two of them on the vacation. Every great religion, corporation, or long-standing family that's got family wealth has three things in common. Number one, they've all initiated rituals in their life. Rituals are those things that you do on a daily or weekly basis to reinforce the habits that you want to create success. The second thing is traditions. Traditions are the things that you come together for I mean, we've got our traditions that a lot of people have with Christmas or Easter, or we just had Valentine's Day. Like those are, those are traditions, but like family traditions where you say, hey, like we do this thing that we call the Christmas roast. It's a family tradition. And <laughs> everybody gets to draw a name and then you get to relentlessly tease them. <laughs> and, you know, and sometimes we make videos, sometimes we create skits. And it's the most anticipated thing in the year. That's a tradition that we look Love forward it. to. And yeah. it's one of those things that the kids will go, oh, I don't care what my friends are doing. I want to be with my family. So that's why we like traditions. And a tradition we want to initiate this year, we're calling it the Summer Olympics. And everybody gets to create their own thing. It could be anything from, you know, uh, basketball or, or cornhole or fly fishing. Like, what's the thing that you want to do? And then we can have a little competition around it. And then we have this ugly, terrible green jacket that I won when I was summit of the inner circle in insurance way back in the year 2004. And they gave me this oversized green jacket like I'd won the masters as a child because I couldn't fit into it. Big shoulder pads, way too long. And I'm like, that's the summer Olympics jacket if you win and you have to take pictures of it in places you shouldn't be wearing it and send it to the family. So these, this is what I mean by traditions, things that kind of call you forward, like a family retreat could be a tradition. You might have a place you go to. We like to go to Italy every summer when there's not restrictions with COVID. And that could be a tradition. And then finally symbols. Like I see you've got symbols on your shirt right now, yes. right? Yeah. Logos yeah. that yeah. are identifying markers. When you go to my cabin, you'll see right above the fireplace is a massive crest built like it was from medieval times out of steel. And it's got our symbols on it. And my, my kids can describe what it is and what it means to them. And so when you have rituals, traditions, and symbols, this is a big part of what you start with with the family retreat. 
And rituals and traditions bring out a lot of fun because you could say, what is one tradition that we could create that we would love to do every year that we would come together that is just a Sapala family tradition, right? Yeah. You just you like get everybody's ideas because people support that which they help to create. And then rituals could be, hey, I want to do a family meeting every week, or we're going to do a bedtime routine, depending on the age of your kids, right? Like you just create these rituals that become parts or little vignettes and space in your life that call forward an investment into family. Because I think legacy is the thread that we weave while we're alive that then impacts people while we're here and after we're gone, not just the money we leave behind. And so rituals and traditions are some of the most useful tools to create a lasting legacy today. I asked my daughter the other day, I said to babe, I'm going to build this crazy house here in Dallas. Whether you build it or you get one, either way, would you? And, and, and I said, babe, if I die in it, do you want it? Do you want this massive estate? She goes, oh, for sure. Yeah, I would love it. So let me repeat the question. I'm not sure if you heard me. But if I died in that house, I took my last breath in that house. This is a massive estate with lots of land. Do you want to inherit the house? Do you want to take ownership of the house? She goes, oh, oh, oh that's weird, though. I, I said, and I, I've always spooked my kids. I said, babe, you know, uh, this is before this question. I said, if you ever walking around and or you're with your friends, your family, and suddenly you smell cigar smoke, but nobody around you is smoking cigars, that's your father visiting you. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's, nice. That's so, nice. That's so weird. So I, I said, imagine, babe, you guys are having dinner at the house that you inherit from me in this mansion that we, we built, but nobody's smoking over dinner. Definitely not. And you smell cigar smoke. It's me visiting. How would you feel? <laughs> just, I'm just freaking her out. That's awesome. But, but it's like, that stuff happens, man. Yeah. And I can see you doing that. I can see you haunting them with your cigar scent, you know? <laughs> uh, by, by the way, we, we, in a beautiful way, though. In a beautiful, a beautiful you know, yeah. uh, memory way. Oh, that's, that's dad visiting us. Yeah, everybody's running out the out the dinner table. Ah! But uh, you know, when, when when we're looking at asset, by the way, this is beautiful. Uh, one, two, three. This is this is awesome. This is gonna open up some conversation between me and my wife because we just sat down with our estate planning attorney because we have a blended family, mm -hmm. and we had the uncomfortable conversation like, okay, if something happens to me. I had kids before you. I had kids before you. So who's what's the pecking order of this, and what goes to the family estate, and what goes, you know, uh, to to so and so? And it was a pretty interesting conversation. I, I, I uh, quite frankly, I wish I had this before um, uh, we got married. Um, not that I regret anything, but you know, I, yeah. I, I, if, if I was going to create a checklist of what to talk about with the blended family, I'd like to have this conversation before before the marriage because. Uh, by the way, my, my wife, she had some great answers for this, and it showed me also her heart and her spirit for, you know, loving you know, the great. kids I had beforehand. Um, let, me, let me shift this. Okay, so you talk about cash flow insurance in yeah. the book, right? Cash That's flow just insurance. a term that I made up. Sure. And just, you, you hear, just made the term up for the book. Yeah, right, right. And you got all sorts of terms out there. You got, uh, you got uh, infinite banking by Nelson Nash. You got, you know, the missed fortune strategy. You got... What else? LERP, life insurance, retirement plan. Yeah. Bank but, on yourself. Yeah. All this kind of stuff. Yep. And the, all those are, mar those are just a philosophical, you know, ways to explain. To market it. Yeah. To market it and basically funding a life insurance policy. So let's get into the meat of it. Uh, we had yeah. this discussion. There's, there's many different policies out there. So walk us through the difference in your opinion and your viewpoint and your professional experience, uh, Garrett, the difference between whole life the difference between universal life and the difference between index universal life. And, and okay. let's, let's, let's yeah. remove variable because, you know, it's, it's too volatile. We're not even talking about variable. Yeah. Yeah. So EF Hutton came up with this brilliant idea in the late seventies because interest rates back then were double digit. You could literally put your money in a savings account, a money market, a CD, and you're getting double, you're getting 10%, 12%, 14%. And so they were like, hey, we've got people that got all this cash. We want to get that interest rate. But when you pay tax, it really hits it. So they really came up with the concept for universal life. And, and, and what they would do is just stuff that thing with money. They'd be like, let's just buy this teeny policy and just pour so much cash into it. And it would just pump that policy up. And the government stopped in and said, hey, 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 
It's a little too aggressive here. We think that we need to add these things called modified endowment contracts and limits. And, and so it kind of changed the nature of that, right? Um, but you can think about it. Like people could put small amounts of money if interest rates would have stayed the same and become multimillionaires. Over, you know, if interest rates would have stayed 12%, 14%, you just put money in that policy, let it ride for 20 years, 30 years, and you are going to be, you're going to have so much money on a small amount of money. But as you know, interest rates have been so low for so long now. So the way universal life was really designed was it took the concept of term insurance and said, hey, that's something that renews every year, but we're gonna put more cash above and beyond that term insurance into the cash value that now has the protection of the insurance from, from taxes. And so the, the only issue with those original policies is the cost of the life insurance was about 20% more than a regular term policy. But people didn't care early on because you and I would have been like, cool, we're gonna get 14%, 15%, and we can stuff so much money in there that the insurance costs are negligible. And why, was, the, why, why was that, Garrett? Why would the, the typical cost be that much more than a typical insurance policy? Is it the, you're, you're not talking about premium, you're just talking about the internal cost. The, the internal cost, and it was because it was easier to hide because the insurance companies could just, and because early on, when you could put so much money in it, the cost of insurance was a secondary consideration. Cause you're like, cool, I'm gonna get this $300,000 policy. I'm gonna put $3 million in that bad boy. Yeah. And, I, and I, I'm not gonna pay tax on my interest of that 3 million. So I'm saving 10 times more in tax than I'm paying in this insurance cost. Who cares? That's why that happened, right? So no problem. But then when the rules changed, we had a couple issues. The rules changed on how much you could put without mecking the policy, which meant you had to get more death benefit in order to put more money in it. Otherwise you have to pay tax. Otherwise you have to pay right. tax on the growth. Yeah. yeah. And so what happened is they started buying bigger death benefit policies. And and the early policies of universal life were not as efficiently designed as they are today. So what happened is those people that bought in the 80s. They're like, this is awesome. And then they'd come out with a new policy. I'm like, by the way, this one has a new bell and whistle. Yours doesn't. And you're like, well, I want that one. So they would, what is it? 1031 or 1035? 1035. I can't, I was, it's 1035, right? They'd just roll that over to that new policy unless they didn't have the right health. So what happened to the early universal life policies is a lot of those went from the, the current cost system to the guaranteed cost system over a 20 year period of time. So the current costs are based upon how many people are dying per thousand. Hey, we, these are the pricing things. So it looks really great on paper, but now we go 20 years down the road. If you were stuck with the original policy, interest rates are much lower in universal life. Now you can't put as much money into it. And the cost of insurance went to the maximum because the only people left in those policies were people who didn't have good health. And so the original EF Hutton policies, as well as the Penn Mutual was a company I studied that I actually like Penn Mutual a lot. I mm -hmm. actually have a Penn Mutual policy, but their early universal life policies really did not hold up long-term 30 years later because that cost of insurance and the lower interest rates imploded those policies. You had to actually pay more to keep up with what you wanted. So, so that was the universal life problem. And today interest rates continue to be low Yep. So universal life isn't an overly attractive policy. There's only so much you can put in without triggering the, the tax consequence. And they're charging you based upon how much cash you have in relationship to your death benefit. That net amount of cost is what you're being charged on. So we're being charged on more these days than we used to years ago. And interest rates are low. So I, I don't have any universal life. I don't know if you do. It's just interest rates are too low for me to do it. Yeah, yeah. Because every time the interest rates drop, also the interest rates on the policy it will eventually drop too as well. So, yep. and so that's about a great explanation. Universal life versus uh, uh, universal life versus whole life. Uh, whole life been around for 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 ages. Uh, right. And let's talk about the old whole life policies because the old whole oh, life policies. I would have definitely in the eighties, if I wasn't two years old in 1980. I would have jumped into the EF Hutton deal. It was a much better deal than whole life was at that time. Whole life when it, you know, it's been around for a long time, but the early policies did not have increasing death benefit. So what happened is 
you get your cash value to kind of grow mm -hmm. death benefit would remain level and eventually those became the same thing and it paid out when you turned 100. right so it became a they basically endowed at that point yeah, yeah. so they didn't really they, they were okay but they weren't great because even if interest rates were high the whole life policy interest rates weren't as high as other interest rates so universal life would follow those higher interest rates faster than yeah. whole life would and because you could overfund the crap out of the universal life, it, it, you could just overcome the cost of insurance better than you could in a whole life policy. Okay. So, but let's fast forward to, to, to today. I have 27 whole life policies, which sounds like a lot, <laughs> but what you got to realize the first one I bought, I was like 19 years old and I put 50 bucks a month into it. And then I started mm -hmm. making more money. So I got another policy and then I had kids and then I had business partners. So. It's just as time has gone on, I bought more and some of them are relatively small. But what I also have one indexed universal life policy. So when do I use whole life? When do I use indexed universal life? That'll be part of the question. But sure. Yeah, yeah. What I like about my whole life policies is I personally, I my preference is to go with mutual companies for whole life. So mutual company owned by the policyholder is not publicly traded. Um, you know, so mutual versus a, stock holding company. Gotcha. Exactly. Okay. So you know, I haven't really proven this out since like, oh, five was probably the last time I researched it. I, I do know that there was one stock company I looked long term that had done really well. And then mass mutual bought them out anyway. So they became mutual eventually as it was. But I so I have mass mutual policies. I have pen mutual policies. I have guardian policies. I have one America policies. I have emeritus, which is my least favorite of the five. So I like to use paid up additions, which is a PUAs. flexible over, yep. yeah, PUA flexible overfunding. I mean, every insurance agent knows what we're talking about. Anyone that's not an insurance agent, yes. I'm kind of giving it for them. Sure. Uh, yeah, yes, yes, of course. And so I like the flexibility, like where if I put at least $100 in every year, I can put more into it. Yep. And as a business owner, there's, I mean, my cash flow ebbs and flows. I mean, you know, like if I sell my comedy special, there's a big chunk of money that comes in. But funding that, you know, a bunch of money goes out. So I like that I have some flexibility with that. But with my whole life, I have four things I can count on. Guaranteed premium, guaranteed interest rate, guaranteed death benefit, and guaranteed cash value. Like they cannot change those factors from the contract. Now, when I look at the contract and I look at the guaranteed side, it's anemic, it's not exciting. It's nothing to go, oh, this is great. It takes so long to finally get to a point where you're like, great, I broke even. And by the time you broke even, inflation ate your lunch. So the guaranteed side is kind of irrelevant more quickly with whole life because as soon as you get a dividend as soon as the dividends paid it becomes guaranteed even right. though the dividend it is not guaranteed so i like to go with companies that have paid a dividend for at least 100 years so did they pay during the great depression did they pay during world war ii did they pay you know during the great pandemic. recession yep. yeah yep. did they pay during a pandemic because i, I just want to see that they have the wherewithal to do that and so that's the kind of companies I go with. Now, Emeritus didn't pay during World War II, but it's only because their shareholders voted to take the dividend and put it towards war efforts. So they actually voted for that, which is kind of crazy, but every other company paid the whole way through. So, so once that cash is there, it becomes guaranteed. And eventually you could do a reduced paid up policy where you could lower your death benefit. And then, you know, it's not eating away at your cash value, or maybe you have enough dividends that are strong enough later down the road that if you never make another premium payment, you're okay. What I like is if I ever touch my cash value, if I ever take a loan or withdraw, I don't negate any of my guarantees. That's one of the things. Now, I don't look at my whole life cash values as being an exciting rate of return. I look at it as being 400 to 800% better than a savings account and a money market account and a yeah, CD. Yeah. I look at it as tax advantaged over those things. But I also look at it very differently. And I think this is maybe what the Rockefellers opened my eyes to. I look at the value of the death benefit and the cash value, because in the newer whole life policies, your death benefit grows as your cash value grows. And that death benefit could be worth way more than the original death benefit if you lived a life expectancy, where the old whole life policies didn't do that. So again, if it's 1980, you and I get together, I think we're going universal life at that time. Why would we buy these anemic whole life policies that are barely pushing death benefits up at all? And for years before that, weren't doing that at all, right? They just endow eventually. Yeah. But when they change the, the modified endowment contract rules, it's like, well, whole life becomes attractive as a storage facility for our cash. 
a place to store our cash that when the market goes down, we don't have a downturn. Mm -hmm. That it's something we can count on. And, and one of the ways I like to invest is when the market goes down, that's when I see opportunity and I want to access my cash values. So there was a business I bought in 2014 that was in distress. And because I could grab those cash values quickly, I was able to buy that business. I had a cabin that I bought that had multiple bids on it, two others, but I had cash that I pulled from my cash values to buy that. And that cabin has appreciated by uh, $500,000 since I bought it in 2018. Wow. And that was, that was based upon an appraisal. I actually had a realtor think I could sell it for $750,000 more than I bought it for without a concern. So, so if I didn't have my cash values and I was going through traditional financing, I might not get that property. So I like using my cash values as my place that I would capitalize. But, you know, I didn't touch my cash values from 2015 to 2020. I just let them go. I was like, hey, I, I'm sitting in cash because I'm not sure what to do. I don't see enough opportunity and I've got enough cash to invest in my own projects. But when 2020 came, I was like, ooh, there's a lot going on here. I bought three and a half acres with another cabin on it in our development that wasn't even for sale. We yeah. just started reaching out to our neighbors and someone said, well, I'm going to retire in three years. I'm like, I've got cash if you want to sell and then I'll rent it back to you for three years. And we did that because I knew it was a good investment. And then when everybody else in the development found out we bought it, they're like, I wanted to buy it. I'm like, well, I have the cash. Did you have the cash? I'm an easy buyer. Right? Yeah, because, because there, there's no contingencies. Like, like I, I make the offer, but it's contingent upon me either selling a property or the mortgage company saying I qualify for the loan. You just, hey, right. you called an 800 number, send me, send me my check, you know, right? And there it right. is. Right, and, and, and look, I, you, from 1944 to 1981, the top tax bracket in America was over 50%. So what I like is if the taxes go up in future years, I can use a lot more income smoothing having cash value. I could say, look, I could take some income from this taxable thing, but I could supplement that with my tax-free cash value and I could always pay it back if I want to, but I can minimize my taxes in times where taxes are volatile. And a lot of people don't have that income smoothing strategy where they can get some income through capital gain, some tax-free and some taxable, and they're putting all their eggs in a retirement plan basket that is all taxable. Yeah. And unfortunately, that can really confiscate their purchasing power or their ability to, to have an income in the, in the future. So I like that, but I love the death benefit. I love the death benefit because I think I can use the death benefit while I'm alive. Yes. Because I know that's gonna come in when I die because it's guaranteed to come in, which means if I utilize other assets and resources, it, it, not that I would do this, but let's just say I'm, you know, like, uh, I, I'm, there's a, there's these like people that come on for seniors who are like, hey, did you know you can take a reverse mortgage? Oh, right. So let's right. just say let's just say that I'm sitting there and I'm 70 years old and I'm going, hey, I've got this paid off home. Uh, but it'd be nice to have some cash from that dead asset. I live in it, but I don't get cash. I could say I'm going to use my death benefit as collateral, get a reverse mortgage, which is tax free money from the bank, but I don't put the home at risk. Because when I die, the death benefit pays it off. That death benefit gave me a utilization of an asset that was normally doing nothing for me. Yep. And the way that I plan on doing that is not through reverse mortgages, but through charitable trusts. I plan on donating highly appreciated assets like my businesses or real estate that yep. would normally be taxable upon sale to charities of my choice, which means I get to be charitable while I'm alive. Yep. But I sell that at zero tax I get a partial tax deduction and I can take a lifetime income off of that and leave the charity with at least 10%, which means I'd rather give a charity 10% than the government 22%. Right. So, so ultimately the death benefit means I can do that without disinheriting my family bank, without taking away from the cash because I don't want my heirs to come in and have to use banks. I want my heirs to use our bank and we can charge a lower interest rate, but now we get the interest rather than the banks. We're just cutting out the middleman. And that's why I love having these 26, 27 whole life policies. Yep. I can use the cash along the way. I've used it for down payments on real estate, buying real estate outright. I've used yep. it to buy businesses and I've used it to launch a book. I've used it many times. And I've also let it sit there for five years going, yep. hey, it might only be getting, you know, by the time I pay all my expenses and fees, 5%, but it's tax free. Where else can I get 5% tax free that requires no thinking? That's, that's really hard to find. A couple of things come to mind too as well, back to your charitable remainder trust idea. You can also take a portion of that CRT uh, uh, cash flow or, or assets and fund an irrevocable life insurance trust 
just in case your kids feel, hey, I, you just disinherited me out of the family home or the family business. Well, here's the cash that was the equivalent right. of that business with the, with an eyelid. And that's what's nice is I have so much death benefit already yeah. that I've already kind of planned for that. So you don't need that, yeah. So, so that money that would go to the eyelid, I kind of have. But you're right, you can totally do that as well. Yeah. And what's interesting is since 2013, I've... I, my issue with an eyelid, the irrevocable life insurance trust is you have to file crummy letters. That's kind of crummy, which means I take some of my gifting and I'm now putting it into the insurance. I also can't touch cash value, which might mean I just have a, a policy that just is straight death benefit. Right? right. 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 But if you take a cash value policy and use a domestic asset protection trust, you can actually remove it from the estate but you still can control the distribution trustee. Meaning I could say, Matt, I want you to be my distribution trustee. And yeah. I go, hey, Matt, I want some money from my cash value. And you could be like, no, I don't want to do that. And I could be like, that sucks, because I want it. And you're like, I don't care, I'm the distribution trustee. <laughs> and I'm like, all right, well, you're in control of the money as a distribution trustee, but guess what? I'm gonna fire you because you won't give me the money and I can hire another distribution trustee, which what it means is I don't own anything, but I still have indirect control and I don't have to pay estate taxes. Gotcha. Versus the islet, which completely just hands off. It's because it's irrevocable. Once you make that move, right? You can't. You and can't that could be it. the right strategy. Islet could be totally the right strategy for the right person. But I like using whole life domestic asset protection trust, and then I can use my cash values along the way. But I don't have that be part of my estate, and it's still protected from you know the cash value in my state is protected from liability and bankruptcy. But the asset protection trust is another layer of protection. So for someone to try to get to that cash, I've got so many hurdles that are yep. so impossible for them to get to. Yep. Now, I have an equity indexed universal life policy. Right, let's talk about that. Uh, and that some people are kind of like, I'm a whole life guy or I'm an equity universal life guy, yep. right? And so one thing is I like, I'm so stuck in fixed income with, with most of my things inside of so many cash values that I like the idea of having a little participation in upside and I premium financed it. Oh, nice. So I did. Nice. I got to premium finance and the interest rates are so low since we started premium finance uh, several years ago uh -huh. um, that we are creating arbitrage, which the banks do this to us all the time, right? Yeah. Hey, hey, if we want into a bank right now, you know what we'd see? We'd see, hey, guess what? You can get a 1.99% car loan. We're like, what a great deal. And it's like, and we'll give you 0.25% on your money market. You save the oh, wait, bank. that's a huge markup. You're getting <laughs> like 800%. You're getting yeah. so much of a markup. And so I'm going, hey, what if I'm only paying 2%? But as we've seen, like, you know, I'm not, I'm not really a market guy that lets my money ride in the market. This is the only thing I have that's kind of tied to the market. It's not even that tied to it the way that, you know, equity index universal life works. It just kind of gives you an indicator with the index. So I, I have that, but I don't, I don't know how all the policies work today, but the policies back when I was doing one-on-ones from 98 to 2005, my concern was some of the index universal lives, equity index universal lives were that we still have a guaranteed cost issue. What if the guaranteed cost starts to creep up so and what does up. that do? Yep. And do we negate any guarantees by tapping into cash value? Now, sometimes you can add a rider, but I was worried, what if someone misses a payment? Or what if someone underfunds this and it starts eating away at their cash value, right? Like whole life, if you underfund it, it's gonna be slow. It's a tortoise for sure, mm -hmm. but it's less risky. So I look at them as having very different functionality where I'm actually looking at the cash value of my equity index universal life as providing me a yield. I look at my cash value of my life of my whole life as beating, uh, keeping pace with inflation and giving me access to cash. So it's, it's two different functions for me. So if, if I'm looking at this whole thing, you've actually put together the financial foundation using insurance concrete which is whole life policy, which allows you to be a little bit more adventurous and, you know, a little bit more upsidey with the EIUL. And, and, you know, and come and think of, by the way, our agency, this, you know, our agency was funded by our CEO's cash value that he said had inside his life insurance policy. So it's, we are- Look at the return on that. I was at PHP. I saw the return. <laughs> it looks good. It looks good. Looking good. So, and, and it's funny because uh, when, we, when we got an investment, from uh, Oscar de la Hoya, 
uh, of $10 million. I remember at her, you know, Patrick's house, right there, right then and there, he's getting a, you know, he's getting a paramed for a $10 million life insurance policy in case something happens to him. As he got this investment from Oscar De La Hoya yeah. and his investment team, at least the $10 million is paid back to De La Hoya. It stays in the rest of whatever's left over the $10 million stays here at the company. Exactly. You know, um, yeah. So, so when people are looking, so here's, here's some, here's some, uh, um, uh, uh, some pushbacks, uh, not pushbacks or some scenarios that a lot of people have with, you know, and uh, uh, some tactics with uh, yeah. index, uh, index universal life. And, when it comes to this old, old overarching thing as we discussed earlier, what it could be called cash for life insurance, infinite banking, banking yourself, you know, however you want to label it. Is there, because there's, there's very, either, either a hardcore whole life or hardcore IUL. So let's, let's be, let's, let's flip it. Let's flip it. What's some of the downsides of whole life and what are some of the downsides of IUL? If people buy a whole life policy, and they don't properly overfund it and life happens in the first couple of years, they're going to be way in the hole. They're simply going to be in the hole because if they can't make a payment or they cancel that policy, the costs were too great to recover the investment. I mean, it takes years to break even in those policies, even properly funded. And so, okay. so that's, that's one of the issues. The second is when interest rates are really high, dividends don't tend to go as high as interest rates. So dividends are slow. They don't move as fast on the up, but they also don't move as fast on the down. So right now, interest rates are so low, but the dividends of life insurance are doing better than other things. But if, if we had another high interest rate time like the 80s, you wouldn't, you wouldn't see the, the uh, whole lives keep up with that. So what that means is you have to be a little bit more active to say, hey, I should probably use my cash value for something right now. You know, I, I should probably tap into that because of what's happening out there in the economy. Um, and if so, take advantage of that. Yeah. Yeah. So, so that would, that would be kind of the thing with whole life. Uh, let's see. And, and if someone just doesn't really know what they have, they're never going to get the value of the death benefit. They're never going to have those charitable trust ideas come to them. Right. And, um, and if they're using some of these other companies that might take, 10, 12, 14 years to break even, that's an eternity. Yep. So that, that would be another factor I'd see with whole life. Like, you know, I, as, as we know, Dave Ramsey, Susie Orman, they hate on whole life. They I was about to it's, it, yeah. yeah. By term so like, it's a hole you throw your money into. And I got to tell you, the way that they teach it and the way that they talk about it, they're right. The, the, the ways that the, have, they're talking about is like the worst case scenario funded in the worst possible way with a general company but it's also interesting that, you know, let's say that you could get like the highest I've ever gotten is 6.12% net of expenses tax-free inside of my, one of my insurance policies for, cause I, I started just like the perfect year and the way it's been around and the way I funded it. And Ramsey would say, well, why would you put more money into that? I'm like, well, of course I would. Cause it's getting a good interest rate and I can tap into it. It's not an IRA that's restricted unless I'm making a down payment on a first home or unless I have a major trauma or issue that, that qualifies as a hardship, I can get that money anytime I want for whatever reason I want. Yeah. So, so that's the down. That's Without waiting for 59 and a half rules and all that stuff. Yeah. Yeah. The downside of equity indexed universal life is it is predicated upon a market that I'm worried about in the future. And the reason I'm worried about the stock market in the future is I was worried about the stock market going into 2020 and I had no clue there was gonna be a pandemic, no idea. Like it wasn't on my mind. I was, even when I first heard about this stuff, I was like, ah, it'll blow over, no big deal. You know, I was, I was completely wrong. Um, but quantitative easing where the Federal Reserve decided to put trillions of dollars yeah. to pump up the market, the money went to Wall Street. And what Wall Street typically did with it was they did stock buybacks which meant that they could finance this with a debt instrument rather than equity and that they could retain the value. And ultimately that pushed the value of the market up at a time where we saw high unemployment, even though we're on the other side of that. In a time where we saw a lot of issues, we created a false situation where we've added 40% more money to the money supply. That's a massive amount. Wow. That artificially propped the stock market up. So when I'm looking at my equity index universal life, I'm like, 
hey, I've had a great several years with it. Like it's done better than I thought it would because I kept going, when does the market come back? When does it come down, you know? Yeah. And, it, and it really hadn't. So, and it, I, cause I didn't know we do quantitative easing. That wasn't something that was invented. Funny illustration. <laughs> right. So, so I worry about the market's performance in the future. And we can't like, it's kind of like when I got into financial services in 98, we just had the eight year bull run of the 90s. Yeah, and so yeah. I remember the first time when I was 18, when this guy sold me the BUL, he's like, oh, we're just going to conservatively estimate on this future value calculator. What if you got 18%? And of course, we're going to do better than that. We're going to get 30. And so I'm like, you know, which is illegal, but, but that's the thinking of the 90s, right? Because anybody was making money in the 90s until yeah. 2000, 2001, 2002. And I feel like we've had a bit of that run that might come out limping a little bit. I mean, we don't know what will the Fed do? What will happen with, you know, when will this be an endemic versus a pandemic? And, you know, what, what yeah. happens with supply? Chain? There's just so many factors we can't control. So I have a concern about that because highs and lows, where if it's too high and too low, hurt the performance. If it's, if it's volatile, but within a range, index universal life is awesome. It's great, right? right? So will they change cap rates on new policies? Will they change minimum guarantees? Like what will they do in the future will be one of the things. So I think yeah. existing policyholders will probably have it better than future policyholders might have it because yeah. they've had the situation that's been really great for it. Now, it depends on each policy. Do, what are your guarantees if you tap into your cash value? How do they assess your expenses? Do they, accept, do they assess it on the net amount of risk based upon the death benefit versus the cash value? And what happens if you take that cash value out? What happens if you loan from that? These are the things we have to understand about the equity universal life product. Because when we look at the accumulation phase, we don't always look at what distribution can do to that policy. Yep. And if people's health suffers in the future, like, because what's kind of crazy is there was 40% higher non-COVID deaths in 2021 over 2020. Wow. And so the, so insurance companies are looking into this, right? Yeah. So what happens is if there's more people dying in a way that impacts the bundle, it can increase the cost of insurance, which therefore will lower the overall internal rate of return of the policy. So it's just, those are the, the factors that I, that I would be most concerned about with equity universal life, you know, equity index universal life. Uh, but so they both have their issues. And some of the things that we also have to, you know, a couple of questions, of equity and universal life. It's because uh, I remember was, I'm selling the first generation of this back in early 2000s and the, the cap rate was 12. Well, as soon as the market had a problem with it, there was a minimum cap rate they can drop it to. And that's what they started doing. But you have to ask yep. yourself, am I okay with whatever the minimum cap rate is of the index universal life policy? If I'm okay with that, then you can, then you can roll with it. Uh, another thought too is with, with, with IULs, if, if you really want if you really want to bail on the index, what type of fixed interest rate does this policy? Because you can flip it from one, one bucket to yeah, the good other, point. You can flip, right? You can flip it from the IUL, you can flip it over to the fixed bucket. And yep. is that interest rate of the fixed bucket also going to be uh, a, a, a competitive to what you get inside a whole life uh, a contract to as well? So, you know, right. and, th and that's why, and, and let's, let's talk point. about this, Garrett, there's not a lot of training about, about this stuff. Like what you and I are talking about, there's not a lot of training in the insurance industry when it comes to this. Like, like I'm looking at you and I, we're both in our late 40s. And we're like OGs in his business because we, we kind of grew up in, in that type of era, but there's no right. like training. We I got mean, the gray in the beard. I got it in the hair, but we both got it in the beard. Yeah, yeah. So what, what's, some of the, what's some of the warning signs that you have to, if somebody's watching this video, it's like, oh, let me, let, me get, yeah. let me go down the street to, you know, XYZ insurance company and let me, let me do what Gary just said or what Matt just said. What's some of the, you know, flag, uh, red flags that you have to ask an insurance agent then? Yeah. So first off, I like that I'm completely max funding my IUL, complete max funding. And I may not have the death benefit in the future because if the cost of insurance goes up, I have so much whole life. I'm just looking at what's the performance of my cash. And I can measure that year to year. Yep. And so far, pleasantly surprised out. It's exceeded my expectation. Now, um, I learned about this stuff because when I was, when I signed up to be an agent, I was putting people in mutual funds in 98, 99. And, and this was like, returns. Van Kampen, Janice, everybody. Yep. everybody can... Yeah. Janice, man. Love me some Janice, bro. Just <laughs> love me some Janice. Uh, you know, 
I, I, I had my grandma and grandpa. I had yeah. my aunt and uncles. I had all these people. And they're like, I was a financial Einstein because anyone was making money. And then 2000 comes and the market starts to go down and they go, hey, what should we do? And my, the firm was like, well, just tell them they're in it for the long haul. I'm like, tell them the market's on. So all this kind of stuff. And so well, I really lost started 50% to question of what they put in there. It's, just not, it's not an easy tell. So I just decided I would fly somewhere once a month because I wasn't married at the time and just study. I, I was young, so a lot of people would meet with me. And I went to home offices in New York of some of these companies. And I met with actuaries, actuaries that would actually look at my shoes, not at my eyes, right? And I would, and, and dude, I got to tell you, man, these guys, they, they scared me at times because they would tell me stuff that I had no clue about. I remember this one general agent out of New York, ponytail in the back of his head, bald on top. And, and, I, and I had a BUL at the time. And he was like, hey, we're just coming off the biggest bull run. Let's look at your BUL, compare it to what would have been like in whole life. And it was the same, dude, off of a bull run before the market went down. And then he exposed all the problems of the downturn because there's no, you could go down as far as you want in a BUL. There's no floor. And it, dude, I was sick to my stomach and was like, holy crap. So I, I fortunately was able to convert that within Guardian, but that, that opened my eyes. So, so the question you brought up, what is your cap rate? And to what level could that cap rate go down in a changing economy? What's the minimum? What's your spread? If you don't have a cap, what's your spread? Knowing what that is can be really essential. You know, um, what's the minimum guarantee? Uh, what, what is it with the minimum guarantee and the highest cost and what money would you have to potentially come up with? Mm-hmm. Obviously, it's not going to go to minimum and, and, and maximum at the same time. Minimum interest rate maximum cost of insurance we would be in everyone's in a world of hurt if that happens it means everything's melting down but realistically what happens if that gravitates towards that if that gets more expensive what does that do to your return because i think that it's human nature to go in depending on your money persona either overly skeptical or overly optimistic those are kind of like the two general investors in the world right the the people that no matter what it's never going to work and no matter what it's always going to work and so I think that a lot of times it's easy to look at an IUL and go, this looks amazing on paper without looking at the guaranteed cost side and what that impact will be on your cash value and knowing if you miss a payment, if that impacts your guarantees or know what the impact is by borrowing or taking out of a draw on the cost of insurance. I think knowing those things make a big difference and then understanding what are you doing it for? Are you doing it because it's tax deferred with tax free potential growth? Are you doing it because you like the, the range of that versus letting it ride in the market, which could be a little bit more volatile? Or is it a death benefit thing? And I like with whole life, I can kind of count on cash value and death benefit with my IUL. I'm really banking on the cash value. That's awesome. Gee, this is probably one of the most technical interviews I've ever done, man. So kind of I ranks think about up it, I just did comedy for your group. And here we are talking <laughs> technical insurance today. You know, I mean, you never know. <laughs> But what's the, stored in this mind of mine? You, you and I have built businesses based on having to sell this to, you know, people asking these type of questions and it's in us, you know, and, and, and we don't have to look over our shoulders wondering if we did the right thing because we prepared, we studied, we educate ourselves, make sure we do what's best for. And we're client. doing it ourselves, right? You're doing it yourself. Yeah. I'm doing it myself. Like, like it was heart wrenching to go to my early clients in the year 2000. Between March and May, I had to face all of them and go, I don't really know what I'm doing. I just put your money in this fund. Like you should either find a different advisor or wait for me to figure out something out better. But can you move to cash until I do? And that was really hard to swallow because I was irrationally arrogant at that time of my life, feeling like, oh yeah, like I'm in finance already. I was telling people I was a financial planner and I just had a six and 63 and a life insurance license. I didn't have an RIA. <laughs> It just sounded or CFP. Cool, you know? Yeah, or CFP. <laughs> I didn't have any of those designations, but but that was a that was a tough lesson and a tough pill to swallow. So at that point, I was like, I want to be informed. I want to be educated. I want to do the best thing for myself and those people I'm working with because I don't want to face them again and be like, uh, sorry, uh, this wasn't yeah. the right plan. And so one more story on this. When I went to I went to Scotland, my my last year I was in personal production for a summit of the inner circle with Union Central at the time, which is now Emeritus. And while I was there, I'm on the bus with two different presidents because there was 
Emeritus was going to buy Union Central. And so you had both presence of mm -hmm. both companies. And they were, they were talking about this crisis they were facing with BUL, that they saw a lot of lawsuits coming because they were oversold and, and they were not performing because of the year 2000 to 2002 Ouch. and what that had done to the policies. And so we get into this meeting. So the whole time they're kind of just wine and dine you the whole time on the trip, but you have to have a three or four hour meeting. And in that meeting, the old guys were like, can we convert these VULs to IULs? And can we, you know, move them over to whole life without, and can we get paid a commission on that? Like, absolutely. You can't get paid a commission if we're going to convert it. You're the one that sold them and was paid the first time, but they were really concerned about the liability the companies had because of the volatility that the, and the, you know, cause think about it, you're in a BUL and you have a market dip. And when the market goes down, your, your separate accounts go down in value, mm -hmm. which means your cost of insurance goes up, up. which right. is a double dip. You're, you have lower you share value, value yeah. and higher cost of insurance. That's going to accelerate the downturn. And so I bought a BUL in the 90s where you didn't think about the downturn. You just thought, oh, and dude, they were showing me putting 40 bucks a month in this thing and 40 years later being a multimillionaire. I mean, yeah. it, was, it was insane, you know, but, <laughs> but it, it, it's how I cut my teeth and I learned, I learned the lesson. Oh, sorry, it was 70 bucks a month. But, it, it, but the bottom line was it, $40 of that 70 was the cost of insurance. So I wasn't getting enough money into the funds and I wasn't really going to get this 18% every year type of return. So um, you know, I, I love the way that you could dissect and, and talk about this and that we're just having a conversation yeah. about two uh, sometimes totally different mindsets around insurance, right? Two different camps almost like where they yeah. would almost argue. And, you know, I've written about the more about the perils of IUL than I have written about the perils of whole life, because there's a lot yeah. more known about the perils of whole life. You know, we talked about the early policies. We talk about how long it takes to break even. We talk about all those things, but yeah. Universal life, uh, you know, index universal life is really a lot newer than whole life at this point. And, uh, yep. you know, I don't think we've seen the full ramifications of poor policy design or poor market performance. And ultimately, I think it's an extraordinarily viable tool when utilized properly. It's just, you know, sometimes not understood. Well, uh, Garrett, I, I appreciate this conversation. Now, listen, I uh, 60 seconds. Um, I would love a 60 second um, answer for you because we are attracting and recruiting and training and developing the next wave of life insurance agents entering this field. They're part-timing with us to see if they even like it. And then we go, we go full-time with them we, under our supervision on part-time. If they like it, they go full-time and they're off, off to the races. Give us, you know, you came from this in this insurance industry and now you're moving on to the next chapter of your life, edutaining people through, through comedy. What would you tell a new agent today, a new agent today about the, the opportunity of the industry, the success of the industry, the, the good, the bad, the ugly? What would you say to a new agent today entering the field? When I, when I entered the field, they said that like four out of five people within five years were no longer in the field. And I think that if someone's thinking that it's a time for money thing, no, it's it not all effort is created equal. So what type of training do you have? What kind of culture is there? What kind of like willingness are people have to help you, but are you willing to be responsible for the outcome of your income? This is basically an entrepreneurial venture within a structure. There's a structure where there's training and there's support, which a lot of entrepreneurs don't have, but your upside is only limited by your willingness to add value to people's lives, which means you have to gain a skill set of communication. So when you can find a firm that A, can tell you about what's wrong with the policy, the early firms I talked to couldn't tell me what was wrong with the policy that they preferred. You know, the BUL people, that was the only way to go. And then the whole life people, that was the only way to go. And it was like, they were a one trick pony. And so if you can get clear about the the, the strategy, the tactics and the pitfalls, then it's who helps you grow as an individual? Who helps you to really recognize your potential and help you thrive, but you can only thrive through your own personal responsibility and accountability within that structure. This isn't a handout business, but it's one that can be richly rewarded if it calls to you. And it's one that I think can create a massive amount of value for the marketplace, because let's face it, like, People that have millions of dollars get pitched all sorts of investments. 
but people that are just trying to make it, they need to design their insurance properly so they have safety, stability, security, whether they prematurely die that the money comes in or whether they live a long period of time that they still have cash. I feel like putting 50 bucks into a mutual fund is like throwing it away, but you know, doing something in an insurance contract for the middle class, you can design that fairly close to how the Rockefellers did. And that's super unique because if you want to get the investments the Rockefellers got to, good luck, you got to be the Rockefellers. But if you want to design insurance the way they did, you can come fairly close. They had private placement. You know, you're going to be inside of a, of a contract that you can fund up until the MEC limits. And it's fairly close. It's not the same, but it's close. And it's infinitely closer than anything else that those wealthy families did with their money that you could actually do on your way up. Yeah, and I, awesome. I don't know what 60 seconds is because that was probably 180 it, Hey, bro. It felt like it felt like thirty, man. Uh, you, right, you, you uh, yeah, I've been in the industry for a while too, as well, and uh, I just love talking about the journey of this. Like, for example, you know, the product itself hasn't changed my life. I'm mean, obviously I'm still here. You know, it hasn't massively changed my life because you know I've I've barely I've barely dipped into my life insurance policy very much. But the industry has changed my life absolutely, one hundred percent. You know, just being able to be an entrepreneur with no college degree, without a sales or financial background, and have the opportunity for somebody to mentor me and coach me and pull me up to the next level such an invaluable thing. And then if I make a mistake, it doesn't cost me a lot of money either. If I, if I screw up, I just got to swallow my pride, swallow my ego. A lot of people start a business, they're losing millions of dollars in inventory and supply chain and all this crap happening. And Man, then, this, this does have less moving pieces, which means you can get out of the gate a lot faster. Like I, I started it at a company that gave me a base salary, but I got, I had to earn the commission to, to keep that. And then I could make more than that. And what was nice is I'm 19 years old and I'm getting good training and I'm around people and I'm asking a lot of questions. I was labeled a fanatic because I asked too many questions because I wanted to know, especially after 2000 happened. And I felt like I made, I didn't put my clients in the best situation, you know, but it really opened up my eyes to like, wow, that was, that was the best way for me to be an entrepreneur from 98 to 2005. And then I took a little harder route with, books and you know it, you know creating yeah, self-study content and stuff like that but it, <laughs> yeah. it's rewarding but i gotta tell you like if i would have just stayed with that my renewals i had to walk i walked away from my renewals you know i walked because in order to to create the content i create and be with the our the you know the, the what was it park avenue securities they wanted everything pre-planned and programmed and so i had to i had to cut ties in order to yeah. in order to build this so um, but the nice thing is you guys create it more entrepreneurial than they did and, and create an opportunity where someone can actually build a business within that business. And I think that there's a lot of opportunity within that. And it's with a real product. It's with something that really people can utilize and benefit from versus just, you know, is, is something that's a miracle potion that isn't a miracle. <laughs> That being said, uh, we're going to put Garrett's links here uh, all at the bottom. Make sure you pick up his book. Uh, easily can find on Amazon all of his books. New York Times best-selling author, Garrett Gunderson. And uh, make sure you follow him also on IG, too, as well. We'll put your IG links here, too, as well. Put a nice little graphic. But my editor is going to have a great time illustrating these life insurance concepts here in a second. <laughs> With that being said, if you're watching this on Facebook, make sure you click like and follow our business page, Money Smart Guy. And if you're watching this on YouTube, make sure you click like, subscribe, and hit notifications to be alerted the next time we upload our next episode. Gary Gunnison, thank you so much for investing your time in your seven figure squad and investing a little bit of your time and us playing a little bit about your success story in the next wave, massive wave of comedy and edutainment, educating people about money through it, through comedy in this next phase of your life. So I appreciate you, brother. I appreciate you. Take care, man. Until we meet again, continue to live smart, continue to love smart, and be money smart today. Let's <laughs> go.